Happy Easter to everyone uh, watching this today, uh, and happy future Easter for everyone watching this uh, after today. Um, wanted to do another reading today from the uh, AIDS for the Preacher section from um, Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics Index. These are some of Barth's thoughts uh, on the resurrection of Christ, specifically geared to help pastors sort of in Easter sermons, and wanted to share some of what he was saying here. Um, I won't do the reading today because it's pretty long, um, but the section I wanted to look at is paired with 1 Corinthians 15, so Paul's reflections on the necessity of the resurrection of Christ, the bodily resurrection. Um, Bart does have some interesting reflections on the gospel stories of uh, the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus, but they can be a little bit confusing if you're not plugged into um, kind of some existential discussions going on in his time. So I thought it would be a little bit easier to read from... Uh, some reflections that Bart has with 1 Corinthians 15 uh, relating to Easter. Uh, and after that, I want to read one of the prayers that Bart wrote uh, for use in his church while he was a pastor on Easter. So, uh, the text is 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to refresh, you can always pause and read that section. Um, but here are some notes from Bart on that. Uh, in two sections, both of them coming from Church Dogmatics Volume 4. So the first... The new Christian life is only a beginning in the further sense that, it, that in its totality it hastens towards a goal which awaits it beyond its confines, or rather which comes to meet it. It is not yet the perfect line which it is properly and finally destined to be. It is only the first fruits and pledge of the perfection in which he will one day be manifested when Jesus Christ shall come, when he shall manifest himself as the Pantocrator of all life, and henceforth... Uh, of his mortal life, when he shall awaken him uh, from his life and partial knowledge of God to life and knowledge, which is no longer in the riddle of a reflection, but face to face, we shall be changed, as First Corinthians said. This is the absolute future which the Christian is impelled and directed by the Holy Spirit to wait for and to hasten towards in this time of which is one long Advent season. There is no question of the continuation into an indefinite future of a somewhat altered life. The New Testament hope for the other side of death is the eternalizing of this ending life. This corruptible and mortal life will be divested of its character as blood and flesh, of the veil of transitoriness. It will put on incorruption and immortality. This earthly tabernacle, which is doomed to destruction, will be clothed upon with the building prepared by God. The mortal will be swallowed up in life. It can only be a matter, therefore, of this past life and its limited time undergoing a transition and transformation and participating in the eternal life of God. This transition and transformation is the resurrection of the dead, which according to the indication given after the resurrection of Jesus, is our participation in his future revelation. This is our hope in the time which we still have. Why, apart from the fact uh, that we see through the small chink are we so fully dependent on faith? Why do we need to speak in terms of only and still and not yet? Why is it and to what end that we must tarry in this tension between then and now and one day? Why is it that our freedom and joy can only be to accept this tension and thus to be continually on the march? What is the basis and meaning of the fact that Jesus Christ did not so come again that all further coming again is superfluous? Why is it that we and all creatures have still a long way to go to the home to which we belong, to the time when we shall enjoy our eternal life on the new earth and under the new heaven, to the investing of our corruptibility within corruption? Why have we still to wait? These are not improper or unbiblical questions. Paul often put questions of this kind. The Apocalypse, uh, Revelation, is plainly occupied with them. Indeed, they are found explicitly or implicitly in the whole New Testament testimony and characterize the assurance with which the New Testament bears the witness to its subject. Would to God that with a more serious attitude to the Easter message, there were in Christendom more of the unrest and impatience which, whatever else may have to be said, are necessarily expressed again and again in questions of this kind. And so moving on now to a different section. By undergoing death in his person, Jesus provided a total and conclusive revelation of its character. For he suffered death as the judgment of God. It would be out of place to say here that he did so as the sign of God's judgment. 
Here, in the person of the Messiah, it is God himself, his embodied grace and help, who is genuinely and definitively present, both as judge and as judged. He judges as he created, between himself and man, the justice which had to fall on man, so that he had to suffer what he had deserved. Death is a consuming force, eternal torment, utter darkness. But he is also judged as, knowing neither sin nor guilt, he caused this judgment to fall on himself, in place of the many guilty sinners, so that it availed for them all, and the judgment suffered by him was fulfilled on them in him. And their dying no longer has to be this dying, the suffering of punishment which they have deserved, but only its sign. What death is remorselessly, uh, as it encounters us, is revealed in this act of judgment. At this point we cannot possibly fail to see that it hangs over us like a threat, and what it threatens with and what it threatens us with. It is the enemy, the last enemy, of man whom God in the death of Jesus, declares to be his enemy as well, and treats as such by placing himself at the side of man in the verdict there pronounced, and snatching man from its jaws by the death of Jesus for him. It remains for us a sign of the divine judgment. We have no longer to suffer judgment itself. What really oppresses the world and us, in spite of the Easter event, or rather, in the light of a true appreciation of it, is not really a lack or failure or absence of its efficacy, but simply the fact that it is not evident to us, and therefore its apparent absence. What confuses us, but ought not to do so, is the fact that in the Easter event, we have to do only with a commencement of the revelation of reconciliation, and its fruit in the ensuing redemption and consummation, but not with this revelation in its full development. In other words, we have to do with the return of Jesus Christ in its first but not its final and conclusive form. The future has not ceased to be the future. From the first event, we, still, uh, we have still to look to the second, in which the light of life which has appeared in him will penetrate and fill even the remotest corners of the cosmos, in which everything mortal and corruptible will put on and enjoy immortality and incorruptibility, and in which God will become and be all in all. We still cannot do more than wait for this event, for the future of salvation in this conclusive and completed form. We can still see it as it were only in a narrow chink in its first form. We have still to believe in its second coming, final and completed form. To this extent, even though we are children of God, we do not yet know what we shall be. This tension exists, and it cannot be relaxed. So I'd like to end um, with a prayer written by Karl Barth for uh, use when he was pastoring a church on Easter. O Lord God, our Father, you are the light that can never be put out, and now you give us a light that shall drive away all darkness. You are love without coldness, and you have given us much warmth in our hearts, so that we can love all when we meet. You are the life that defies death, and you have opened for us the way that leads to eternal life. None of us is a great Christian. We are all humble and ordinary. But your grace is enough for us. Arouse in us that small degree of joy and thankfulness of which we are capable, to the timid faith which we can muster, to the cautious obedience which we cannot refuse, and thus to the wholeness of the life which you have prepared for all of us through the death and resurrection of your Son. Do not allow any of us to remain apathetic or indifferent to the wondrous glory of Easter, but let the light of our risen Lord reach every corner of our dull hearts. Amen.